Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to be examining the concept of enlightenment. Why is it that people throughout the world and almost every religious tradition and cultural tradition pursue the notion of enlightenment? What is enlightenment? Is there such a thing? Is it possible to attain enlightenment? With me today is Mr. U.G. Krishnamurti, a world traveler and author of Mind is a Myth and the Mystique of Enlightenment. Welcome, U.G. Thank you. you know, People often have referred to you as an enlightened being, and I know you're very uncomfortable with, with that. In, in fact, you told me earlier you're uncomfortable with the concept of being at all. Yes. You see, the, the question arises only in relationship with becoming. And enlightenment is uh, also becoming, mm -hmm. you see. So I would go one step further and say that uh, the human mind, if I may use that word, quote and unquote, is interested only in sensual activity, you know, the, the living organism or the human body or whatever you want to call it is only responding to the stimuli. It is not interested in pleasure at all. See, the moment you use thought to experience anything in terms of pleasure, it becomes a pain for this body. And so, yet we pursue sensuality and yet find only pain in it. But we love pain in other words we love and pain. we enjoy pain uh -huh. and call it pleasure you see the, the 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 human body is not interested in pleasure of any kind it is only interested in maintaining the sensitivity of the nervous system and the sensitivity of the functioning of the body so the moment you say a particular sensation is a pleasurable sensation the demand to make it last longer goes with it so then the demand to make the pleasure last longer turns what we call pleasure into pain, and that's a painful sensation to the body. The body is trying to be rid of that pleasurable sensation, and what we are stuck with is pain. It, it almost sounds as if the greater the pleasure, then the greater the pain must be. We have introduced the degree into that what is called pleasure, you see, because the thought is always interested in more and more of something and less and less of the other. I'm not saying anything against pleasure. Mm -hmm. See, the moment you use thought as an instrument to have pleasure, we have there created a problem. Since man has realized, since I, I don't like to use the word man or a human being or uh, in general terms, see, the average man, see, that man is you and I sitting here. So since uh, this uh, demand for permanent happiness is something which cannot be achieved through anything, any thinking uh, that is open to us, we have projected and created what is called enlightenment, God, self-realization, call it by whatever mm -hmm. name you like. So that is the ultimate pleasure. There are stories out of India, you've probably heard, of, of great saints who are supposedly in states of perpetual sexual orgasm. <laughs> that is what these gurus are selling in the marketplace today. You see, even uh, sex is uh, something that the body uh, does not care for. It's, it's a painful thing. And that is necessary for only one purpose, to reproduce one like that. The living organism is interested in only two things. It's a survival, and then it's a reproduction. Mm -hmm. So when once the thought is involved in turning sex into pleasure, we have created a problem. It is the same thought that makes you feel that, you see, the pleasure, you see, can be uh, extended uh, um, into one of degree, into, into longer and longer time, and then you see, keep it going, and so it is more painful to this body. You, you almost sound Victorian in your approach here. I am not, not Victorian. The sex is totally unrelated to the question of enlightenment. You mm -hmm. see, whether 
uh, it has become fashionable these days for all these people to market sex as the means or the stepping stones uh, to enlightenment. But actually and factually, the sex is totally unrelated to what is called enlightenment. Whether you deny yourself sex or indulge in sex, it is of no importance to what you are searching for. But in a culture where you see the denial of sex is uh, maintained as a sine qua non or an essential thing for your spiritual goal, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the gurus in the marketplace who are selling that enlightenment uh, invented this thing called this, this tantric experience mm -hmm. and uh, used that as a means to achieve your spiritual mm -hmm. goal. Is it right, it's either tantric here or abstinence there. And what you're saying Both is. Both are the same, they are totally unrelated to the question of enlightenment. When once you see the, the question of enlightenment or the demand for an enlightenment is freed from sex totally either as a means to it or the denial of it as a means to it, we can look at it in a different way and ask the question, is there any such thing as enlightenment at all? We have accepted, taken for granted that there is such a thing as enlightenment, but we never questioned that because when once you question the whole idea of enlightenment or as you put it, the concept of enlightenment, we are questioning the teachers who have talked about it and we have invested our tremendous faith in them. So the, the sentiment comes into the picture and we accept that as a gospel truth. Well, yes, we have this notion of the great sages of antiquity in, in many different cultures have written and talked about higher states of consciousness and that is, enlightenment. That is true, but I am questioning the very consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. Is there any such thing as consciousness? That is my question. So you become conscious of yourself and the world around you only through the help of the knowledge that is given to us by these so-called uh, sages, saints and saviors of mankind. So is it possible for you to be conscious of anything without the help of that knowledge? So we have to question uh, the very thing that we have taken for granted. We are very naive and mm -hmm. accept it. <coughs> Uh, and then you see, spend a whole lifetime in search of uh, whatever you want to have it enlightenment, uh, God realization, self realization, it, or what you have. In other words, you, you, it seems as if there's a paradox here because, on the one hand, our consciousness, it seems as if it leads us to question the tradition, the so called truths that are handed down to us. And you're saying, but without that tradition, without those truths, we would have no consciousness. You know, that is part of the structure of our thinking. Mm -hmm. You see, unfortunately, the thought has divided itself into two and created, you see, this duality or uh, the neurotic situation for us. The whole culture teaches us that you should not compete. Competition is, is uh, to be eschewed. Ambition is, is something which you should not, you see, uh, have. Spiritual teachings tend to Spir say this. Uh, spiritual teachings, yes, always. Uh, the, I mean, uh, it, demand, certainly demand, in athletics and in demand, capitalism, yes, there's, there is this sense of demand competition. Demand that you should be free from ambition, you mm -hmm. should be free from greed, you should be free from this, that and the other. But at the same time, ambition is absolutely necessary for survival in the society in which we are functioning today. So it is that that has created the neurotic situation for us. We want to pleasure and at the same time we know that the pleasure is giving us pain. So the demand for permanence is the basic demand of thought. Is it is interested in, in permanence. The permanence not of this living organism, but the permanence of the continuity of thought. So the body knows in a way that it is permanent. You see, not in the sense in which we know that this is permanent, that is not permanent but that knowledge is of a peculiar kind that it knows it is permanent. So it is not interested in, in the idea that this is coming to an end one day, you see. So the, the one that is uh, involved in this pleasure movement is the one that is asking the question, what will happen to this living organism when it dies? You see, for the body, there is no such thing as death at all. No. So because it has no way of experiencing the fact that it is alive at this moment and that it is dead after 60, 70, 80 or 100 years at all. 
are, are you saying then that uh, the body doesn't die, but what about the spirit? <laughs> that is the belief, this, the, the self, the soul, the spirit, and whatever you want to call it is invented by thought. And it is that thought that is responsible for experiencing th this, what we call thought, because what you call self, spirit, or soul, or whatever you want to call. I, I don't want to indulge in the frivolity of uh, the root meaning of the words. You see, the, you know, the Latin word, spirit is a Latin word. They have to do with breathing, it, generally. It, it means breathing. Mm -hmm. So you have observed, you see, but an individual stop breathing, and that condition you described it as death. So the fact that you see the breathing stop, the, you want to know if there is anything that will continue after death. You see, it is that no. that is interested in demanding to know what will survive this condition of the body which is called death. Yeah. I mean, I would tend to think that my body will not survive, my body will decay, but perhaps my ability to experience at some level will survive. But can you experience your body while you are living now? You see, if one wants to know anything about death, he has to find out what is it that is there now and not wait until what we call the death that takes place. So, you, do you have any way of experiencing the fact that you are alive today? I say no. Oh. You see, the doctor comes and examines you and tells you that this is your blood pressure, this is the temperature for your body, your heart is breathing, your blood pressure, so on and so forth. So, you are alive. So, you are trying to use that knowledge and experience what you call a living being. But without the help of that knowledge, which is passed on to us by observation of all these doctors, and experience and tell yourself that you are a living being. So when once you are freed from the, the knowledge, you have no way of experiencing that you are alive today, and there is no question of experiencing when you are dead. Mm. I'm giving the talk you. <laughs> well, Descartes, a great Western philosopher, said, I think, therefore I am. And you seem to be suggesting that thinking is, is the opposite of, of living. I think that uh, Descartes, uh, I studied uh, Western philosophy, and uh, he asked the wrong question and uh, answered it in a, in a very funny way. We think, I think, therefore I am. But he never asked the question which he should have asked, the way the Indian philosophers did. Uh, if you don't think, uh, are you there? Uh -huh. So the, the basic question which we have to ask is, what is thinking and why do we think at all? If you don't think, there is still the question there, you see. The question is born out of the assumption that there is a something there, and so that is why he has come out with this statement, I think, therefore I am. If you don't think, where is that I am? Mm -hmm. Well, isn't it true that when we talk of enlightenment, the great uh, sages of India have, have said, when you stop thinking, you can enter into this vast ocean of bliss, and, and that's enlightenment. The bliss is, is <laughs> the bliss or whatever you want to call it, is essential pleasure that we are indulging in. They may have experienced some extraordinary moment, which he described it as a bliss, and tried to share it with us. And that created the problem of us all trying to experience the same thing. So that is the way the knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. That is the way you are also experiencing things. Without knowledge, you have no way of experiencing anything at all. And when once you experience, that experience strengthens and fortifies the knowledge. So this vicious circle goes on and on and on and on. And that structure has no way of uh, breaking through that, you see, vicious circle. Mm -hmm. So we accept that knowledge is necessary for us to experience, and the experience strengthens the knowledge. So um, do we really want, you see, to find out or demand the way out of it, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. How, is there a way out? <laughs> there is no way out. 
because the question is posed by the thought and by asking this question the thought knows that it has no answer. So, that is the only way it can maintain its continuity. You see the thought has invented time, the thought has invented what is called space. You see without the help of the knowledge we have of space and the knowledge we have of time, there is no time, there is no space. The scientists may talk and say anything they like, but they are also saying that there is no such thing as time, there is no such thing as space, there is no such thing as matter, but what is called space time continuum. Is there a space? I question that. Is there a time? The moment the thought is born, the time is there. So, it is that that has invented what is called say the timeless and pursuing that timeless and it knows that it has no way of putting itself in a timeless state because the thought has to be absent in a so called timeless state. It is an invention of the time to perpetuate itself within the field of time. Well, it, it sounds like we are trapped. We are trapped and the very demand to get out of the trap is really the problem. Mm -hmm. See there is no answer to that at all. Well, are you suggesting then that in the, the history of humankind there, there have never been enlightened persons? No, I am not uh, for a moment uh, saying that there is no such thing as an enlightened being. We have plenty of them, mm -hmm. you see. But uh, I question the very, uh, the demand to be enlightened. You see, ah. as I said at the very beginning, to me there is no such thing as enlightenment at all. You see, the enlightenment is in the future. As I said a while ago, it is the time that has invented the thing in the future. Mm -hmm. The future is always, it puts the enlightenment there. So, the enlightenment is part of the knowledge that is passed on to us from these great teachers who claim to be enlightened people. And it is the past that is in operation here, projecting into a future a thing called enlightenment. So, first of all, is there any such thing as the present? I say there is no such thing as present, there is no such thing as now, there is no such thing as the moment here, because if you say this is the moment, this is the present, this is the now, you have already brought into this picture the past. Hmm? In the past I was not enlightened, so I am going to be enlightened tomorrow, but what about now? So am I enlightened or I am, am I not enlightened? What is it that tells me that I am enlightened, that I am not enlightened, that I am free and not free? It is the knowledge that tells me that I am not free, that I am not enlightened. So, if you are not enlightened now, you are going to be enlightened tomorrow. I do not know if, if I make Well, there is a paradox here somehow because it, it, I guess it strikes me that if one is really enlightened, is there is a transcending of space and time. So, that if, if one is enlightened, it is always there. So you, that Assuming for a moment that there is an enlightened being, yes. he has no way of telling himself that he is an enlightened man and there is no question of his trying to enlighten others. I mean as soon as I say I am enlightened, I have already come back. The knowledge about enlightenment passed on to us from generations tells you that you are an enlightened man, you see. So then naturally you want to enlighten others. So, it is a petty little experience which has become possible for me through the help of this thought. So, what I experience and call an enlightenment is a thought induced experience and not really an enlightenment at all. You mean every description of enlightenment is essentially an illusion? Uh, it's, why, why are we concerned about enlightenment at all? Well, it seems like… A way out. Yeah, what you else see, is there to do? The, the way out, you see. So, you, you, you are putting off the problem to a future date. What I am suggesting is that uh, there are no problems at all, you see. What we are stuck with is the solutions offered to us mm -hmm. by the people who you think and I think are in the know of things, that they have the right solutions for the problems. But those solutions have not helped us to resolve our problems. 
but somehow we are caught up in this field of time and time is a hope you see it tells us that by repeating the same thing over and over again you will be able to solve this problem so we these solutions have not helped us to solve the problems at all we are looking here and there and everywhere to find out somebody who can offer us another solution to solve our problems mm -hmm. but what one who is interested to resolve the problem must be ready to brush aside, you see, all the solutions offered by these saints, sages and saviors of mankind in the past and in the present and yet to be unborn. In other words, to truly be free, to truly be enlightened, one has to give up every concept of enlightenment or, or, or every notion of this tradition that we've inherited. You, you are talking as if the concept and you are two different things. Uh -huh. the, uh, the demand for enlightenment and you are two different things. So there is no way you can separate yourself from the concepts. Oh. And but you, you just said that's essential to do. That is essential to do is, is a manner of speaking, is a way of putting things. It's, it's essential and yet impossible at the same it, time. You are not ready to come to terms that there is no problem here and that you are stuck with all the solutions offered to us mm -hmm. by those in whom we have absolute confidence, faith and trust and yet they don't work. The instrument which we are using is the one that is born out of hope. You see, what you are today uh, is the totality of all your thoughts, feelings and experiences. Mm -hmm. That instrument is the only instrument we have and it is a very powerful instrument. That instrument has helped us to achieve whatever we have achieved so far today. So we are not ready to discard that instrument. And at the same time we know that understanding through the help of that instrument has not helped us to resolve our problems at all. And yet we have not given up our confidence, tremendous faith in the instrument which we have been using to achieve our results. Mm -hmm. So that is really the crux of the problem. So when once the understanding dawns on you that that is not the instrument which will help you to understand and solve your problems and that there is no other instrument the demand to solve the problems ceases and instantly. So there is no such thing as understanding at all. How I uh, stumbled into this is, is something which I have no way of knowing. This is somehow it dawned on me that the intellect which I have developed through sharpening it, you see, using it, has no way of understanding anything. And at the same time, the tremendous faith in that instrument is lingered. You see, that, that is the only instrument. I do not know of any other instrument. That's the only instrument I have. And it has not helped me to resolve anything, to understand anything. And somehow, it dawned on me that that is not the instrument and there is no other instrument. So that means it knocks off the whole basis of any other way of trying to understand anything. So the whole idea of uh, intuition goes down the drain and down the tube. Why? Why does intuition go you down see, the tube? You see, intuition tubes? is nothing but a refined, sensitized thought, <laughs> if I may put it that way. Yes. So, but it is still, you see, caught up, you see, in this, uh, um, the use of thought to, to resolve, you see, the problems. Well, wouldn't it be better at least to have refined, sensitive thoughts rather than crude, unsensitive, insensitive well, what thoughts? Is the difference the, um, what is the difference between th a crude thought and a sensitive thought? Well, in, in Western tradition in the 18th century, uh, I, we, we had a notion of the Enlightenment, which, which meant you know, being free of superstition, at least being able to see things as they are. Well, are we free from superstition? Why do we swallow everything? that every scientist dishes out every day. You see, we say it is a scientific, but it is not uh, so scientific. They are as dogmatic as the religious people uh, of the bygone mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. But because what science has given us, the technology, we 
invest a tremendous faith you see in the scientists. Every four years you see their theories are changing. As I said the other day, their interest in uh, trying to find out the fundamental particle is uh, a search in vain, but they will go on and on and on and on and on. They are not going to give up anyway. Yeah. I mean the intellectual effort to solve the mystery of the physical universe is in vain. It is in vain because uh, the fact that the scientist is separating himself from the universe, it is a single unit, you see, the nature and man are not two different things. As I said before, uh, a while ago, or last time, that um, somewhere along, you see, the evolutionary process, this self-consciousness occurred in the human species, you see. But how do you know we're not actually separate? How do you know that the self-consciousness is, is not valid? You know, it is the thought that creates the space, as I said. Mm -hmm. Thought is space. So let me give you an example. Okay, this we have about is, a minute left. This is in touch with this. Yes. What is it that tells you that this is hard? The knowledge that it is hard yes. is the thought, and the thought creates the space between the two and tells that this is hard. Otherwise, there is no space between the two and there is no way that the sense of touch can tell you that this is hard and not soft. I mean, even something as basic as the sense of touch, something we take so for granted, is really just another thought process. Another thought process. So thought is a space, thought creates a space, and in that space we function. Mm -hmm. So the space is something which can never, never be experienced by thought. We're, we're trapped in our own thoughts, yeah. and our thoughts can never really even see themselves. It has no way of uh, looking at itself. You see, what you see there, the very question, is there a thought, or the interest, the demand to look at thought, is created by thought. So what you see there is about thought, and not thought itself. UG Krishnamurti, thank you very much for being with me. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you very much for being with us.